All right, um, we'll get restarted now. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Amy Houtro, and she is Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the University of Pittsburgh, and she also represents the AAP Council on Children with Disabilities. Is that right? Thank you all. It's a pleasure to speak to you. I have nothing to disclose except that taking care of children with disabilities as best we can is my clinical passion, my research passion, and my advocacy passion. Um, I want to start out just talking a little bit about what it means to be medically complex. So this got kind of definitionally defined um, about five years ago by Cohen and all, and it's basically about increased service need and increased service use with chronic conditions that are either very complicated or multiple, and that those children have influences that affect their daily life from those health conditions. So they're impacted in the form of functional limitations or disabilities. And many of these children will need to have um, technology use. So specialized technology such as a G-tube or um, a ventilator or something like that. So when we think about this population of kids, we know that in general, children with special health care needs make up about 20% of children. So those are kids that need or use more service use or have disabilities, but they tend to be relatively minor conditions that are not particularly complicated, like asthma, ADHD, allergies. And then children with disabilities make up about 8%. So those are children who experience limitations in the things that they can do in their day-to-day -day life related to a health condition. And then children who are medically complex make about 1% of children. But they account for a very high amount of resource utilization. In fact, up to 30% of healthcare dollars for children will go to this group. And in the hospital-based setting, especially tertiary care facilities, it's a really high percentage of cost. So from the family perspective, a system goal to help take care of these children would be a family-centered and coordinated network of community-based services that promote the health, development, and well-being of children and their families. And in this graph, you can see that all of these interconnected parts are speaking to each other, and they're coordinated, and um, it, there's a happy little star with the child in the middle of it. Unfortunately, this is much more what it looks like for us today, which is a bunch of gobbledygook and lack of communication and lack of guidance and organization. So this is evidence to me that we really need to be thinking about how to organize care in general for children with um, medical complexity and especially for children that might be emerging in the population who have um, congenital Zika. Um, when we think about how we would measure our healthcare system to meet their needs, the Maternal and Child Health Bureau um, came up with these metrics. So family partnership and decision making and satisfaction with care was their number one. And I think that's a very important thing to be placing the child and the family at the center of what we're doing. The receipt of care in the medical home having adequate insurance, so basically that means that they don't have extensive high out-of-pocket expenses, and that the care that they can get is accessible and meets their needs, um, and so that their insurance actually covers those services. And then the ease in of use of community-based resources, so that might be your early intervention services or your um, school-based services, and then effective transition planning for the young adult. Um, when we look at how we do for individuals who are um, severely impaired or have severe impacts related to their health conditions, we see that we aren't doing such a great job. Some of these we're doing better. Less than half of families feel they have a partnership. Uh, less, about a third have a care in a medical home. But about half of those kids actually have adequate insurance and feel, and three quarters of them feel that their um, community-based services are relatively easily accept, accessed. And then we know we have a lot of work to do in healthcare transition. But for children who are severely impacted by their health conditions, the real truth of this is that less than 10% of those kids are meeting these health system metrics. And so we know that kids who have congenital Zika are very likely um, to also experience the same sort of uh, uh, health care system related issues. So um, I had the pleasure of working with one of my colleagues, Dennis Quo, to develop our clinical report on complexity um, that's coming out of the Council on Children with Disabilities from the American Academy of Pediatrics. And what we set up was two basic health system goals, to maximize health function and development and family function through coordinated patient and family-centered care. Um, for me, this is really important that we have the word family in there more than once, and that we're saying the word function and development. Uh, in addition, another action that we want is to be able to provide proactive 
rather than reactive care. It's that it's intended so that critical medical and health events are averted to the extent possible so children can live successfully in their communities and experience their lives to the fullest and that we are paying attention in an anticipatory way to what the outcomes may be, not just in a reactive way. So this whole issue that we were talking about with swallowing function, for example, is a great example. So uh, very young infants with an intact um, swallow reflex uh, may do relatively well. It might not show signs of aspiration or failure to thrive related, about, related to intake, but later in their infancy may. And so to be a paying attention to this in an anticipatory way than what rather a reactive way when the child comes in with pneumonia or failure to thrive to a hospital, we have a much better chance of helping this child be successful. And so paying attention on the onset and then anticipating what's coming down the road. When you ask families what they need, what they say repeatedly is they want assistance with care coordination. So one of the things that um, came up is that only about a third of kids who um, are getting care in a medical home for children who are pretty seriously affected by their health conditions. And where we're really falling down is not the presence of a personal doctor or nurse. It's not the usual source of care. It's things that fall outside of what the primary care person can do um, in terms of getting coordinated services and uh, referrals when needed. In addition, we know that there's a lot of work to be done in kind of providing family-centered care where families feel like partners. But they also want timely care, so getting the care when they need it, instead of calling and saying, it's going to take you six months to get into the child neurologist. Well, um, six months is too long to wait when it's your child. Um, and then certainly we have a lot of work to do about improving our communication between providers. I think all of us that provide this kind of care have been guilty of asking the parent, so what did the other doctor say? And it's in part because we don't have access to those records, and it's in part because we haven't gone back to look at those records, and also maybe those records don't say adequately enough what we need them to say. And so communication between the providers is living at the nexus of the family. They have to be the conduit of that information. And that information means that um, it is filtered by their um, feelings and understandings of that information. And so um, instead of collaborating well with our colleagues, we're relying on a family to do that collaboration for us, which I think is a major problem and will continue to be an issue unless we proactively address it. And then duplication of services. So um, in your community getting um, some radiology or test and then having that repeated in the um, tertiary care setting is certainly problematic. And then actual access to providers and specialists, uh, whether that be uh, providers in your community, such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, or whether that's to your neurologist or your epileptologist or your developmental pediatrician. And then certainly decreasing out-of-pocket expenses. So um, as we've been more aggressive in terms of tightening insurance opportunities for families. That means many middle class families are actually missing, uh, the, they're having high out of pocket expenses and missing opportunities for services or equipment that, that really might benefit them. What families experience, so these are families of children with medical complexity, is that they're providing a lot of medical care. So there's not nurse in their home providing the care, it's them providing it. So 11 hours a week on average, and then two hours a week on average of coordinating care. So that's actually making the appointments, making sure things get paid for, filling out forms and that sort of thing. And about half of these families are, are are reporting that they have an unmet need for service. And that might be for specialty service, for durable medical equipment service, uh, for home-based services. And about half of them also experience financial burden. And unfortunately, about 40% of them are very dissatisfied with the care. And I think when we're entering an area with a d disease and condition where there's a lot of unknown and there's a lot of fear, we really have to pay attention to what parents have already been saying about the care that they feel that they've been getting and work to optimize it so that we can meet them and their needs as best we can. So in... Um, 
In pediatrics, the medical home is our foundation of care. And basically, when it's operationalized, that means having a place where you get care, a personal doctor or nurse that you identify, family-centered care, which many of us would just call good care, where make people feel like they're partners, um, that they have their voices heard, that they're, they do shared decision-making and shared goal-making, and then getting referrals when needed and care coordination. So I'd like to take the idea of the medical home and implant it in a health neighborhood. And I think this is particularly important because the primary care doctor can't possibly do this all on their own. And um, their staffing resources are not set up to be successful at doing this all on their own. Um, so I'm from Pittsburgh, and so is Mr. Rogers. Um, so this is particularly fitting. So if this is your doctor's office or your medical home, um, this, this looks great for you because, well, here's some public transportation to get you to your appointment, and over here is um, school, and the early intervention office is right nearby. And lucky for you, if your child has an acute event, the tertiary care, quaternary care children's hospital is really not that far away from you. And so your health neighborhood really works very well. And I actually um, want to spend a little bit of time talking about health and medical, because really when we're thinking about the resources that these children will need, they far exceed what we just typically put under our medical umbrella. And um, community resources in particular don't necessarily identify themselves as medical services, but are very instrumental to the optimization of the health and well-being of these children. So this health neighborhood looks really pretty great, but what if you live out here? then it doesn't look so great because you live in a more rural area. You might have less access. It might take you a really long time to get to your um, uh, provider, or you might not be able to do that because of transportation problems. And um, when we think about kids that may be affected by congenital Zika, we're talking about a part of the country in the South with a lot of rural areas and a lot of families living in poverty. And that, that heightens for me the concerns about our ability to actualize the health neighborhood effectively for these children. So it's a little bit of a call to action in recognizing where we're going to find our, our problems. So the idea of the medical neighborhood was really about linking primary care with specialists. And that's through a collaborative agreement. And then um, when you think about it, if you're a specialist, you think about linking in with primary care. And often when you're a primary care provider, you are not only thinking about linking in with a specialist, but all of your other community resources that are available. But it really emphasizes this idea of a transfer of information and an agreement about accountability. So you can delineate care expectations. This is mine, that is yours. So it's the neurologist who's going to ma manage the seizures, but it's the developmental pediatrician or the neurodevelopmental pediatrician or the pediatric rehab doctor who will manage um, the therapies and the bracing and all of those sorts of things. So um, an appropriate delineation means that we can do our best jobs for that child and helps us identify the right people to do their best jobs. And ultimately, that helps us as a team be more successful. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking a little more depth about care coordination. So um, this is from uh, Jeannie McAllister, and she did a big project with the Lucille Packard Foundation, and out of that came a lot of documentation that I'll share with you. So care coordination is a patient and family-centered, assessment-driven, continuous team-based activity designed to meet the biopsychosocial needs of children and youth while enhancing per person and family caregiving skills and capabilities. And unfortunately, we know this is inadequately delivered for a lot of our kids. And this is really quite aspirational, because many of us talk about care coordination just being like getting someone to this appointment and getting it um, coordinated with their imaging appointment that they have right before. Um, so when you think about uh, care coordination, one really important piece about that, and I think very appropriate for the children that um, will be in our practices with congenital Zika and other children who may um, develop later findings, is developing an appropriate care plan, which is really based on a partnership between families and their providers and having established and shared goals. It provides very succinct medical summaries and establishes relationships, and then really does clarify whose action belongs to whom, and develops a plan of action so that um, the, the uh, 
issues that have already been raised can be adequately addressed. So from the provider perspective, thinking about who might benefit from a care plan is really important. So definitely the children who have congenital Zika, children with medical complexity in general, are a great population in a practice to start with. And then you may think about it for children who are at high risk. Um, and in a practice, it's important that everyone does understand the value of having a care plan and that's not laborious, that it turns out to be helpful. Um, and then using multifaceted assessment tools. So um, getting in from uh, interviews and from testing uh, and potentially laboratory testing or on developmental screening and developmental tests and using all of those together to develop those shared goals and then linking other providers in as necessary into the process. Because a primary care medical home can't alone implement a care plan for a very complicated patient. Medical summaries are exceptionally helpful, uh, especially when a patient shows up to an emergency department or is, um, is receiving care in a new place. Uh, and also establishing and negotiating actions. So this is mine and that is yours, and how are we going to carry it through? And then you need to make this plan accessible to the people who need it. And so if it sits in your medical record that doesn't speak to another medical record, then what value does it have? So families need to be empowered to carry it and use it and share it. And then as a provider, Ultimately, from a quality improvement perspective, you really want to be able to track what you're doing, track how you've been using that care plan, and then it's a living document so that you can change it and update it as needed and use it as an approach to care for these children. One particularly important thing that I've been talking about is connections or connectivity with the right people and doing their, their jobs. And so one way to do this is to develop a plan or a map that has the child and the family at the center and then uses this mapping system to identify areas where there may be gaps or where services are particularly robust or duplicative and try to um, work within that care map. So this one, for example, has a category of financial supports, medical specialists, community and state services, informal supports, so that could be um, your church or your community group, uh, child care, whether the child is in school or in daycare, and then school-based um, programming and services, because many children get their services through the school system. So this is a great example of a care map, and many of you may have seen this already. So Rich Antonelli and uh, Kristen Lind um, worked together um, in the primary care, care coordination, medical home world, and she has allowed this to be shared with multiple people. But what you can see is her, her, her son Gabe in the middle and their family surrounding it and a whole bunch of services. So what we're talking about is a very complicated map and things that offshoot from other pieces of the map. Uh, so for example, for her, transportation to school was a, a very big issue and one that took up a lot of space on her map. In addition to, um, the services and community resources they used and the providers that they used. But one of the things that I think is important about this and important for us as clinicians is to take away that we're not just talking about what we're doing in our clinic and we're not just talking about what we're doing diagnostically or what we're doing um, in our hospitals. This is much broader than that. And we recognize that families live in this model of, of much more extensive services and needs and resources and that it's not just where we sit as the locus. This brings me to the idea of interdisciplinary care. So interdisciplinary care is team-based, and we use shared goals and objectives. So multidisciplinary care just means you're all in the same place, and um, lots of multidisciplinary care clinics exist this way, especially for kids who have a specific complicating condition. But the ideal is much more of a transdisciplinary model where there are shared goals or objectives, or a transdisciplinary model where not only do we have these shared goals and objectives, but we have overlap of our responsibilities. And it's very challenging to actualize, actualize that effectively. And so here I'm presenting um, the kind of intermediary, the interdisciplinary care model. Um, so it usually does involve very extensive care coordination and should have database management associated with it. Many times there is a nursing leadership as well as physician leadership, and the nursing leadership, they might actually know what's going on with patients and families in a much more robust way than the physicians would. Um, and it may have multiple specialists. 
So this interdisciplinary care can really be focused in a way to meet the needs of the child and family because you're team-based and you have shared goals and objectives. Um, ultimately, we often focus on specific types of conditions or conditions um, that are a group of conditions, so cerebral palsy being one of them, where it's a group of conditions that make up that diagnosis of children who are similarly affected. Um, and those teams are built around what tip those typical needs of the population are. So if you're running a spina bifida clinic, for example, you would have a urologist, but you don't have your urologist in your cerebral palsy clinic. Uh, but you may, if you're thinking about how to build a team-based care approach for children who have congenital Zika, be needing to pull in, because of the high rates of certain problems, an ophthalmologist into your clinic or an epileptologist into your clinic. Many of these team-based clinics are run out of developmental pediatrics or neurodevelopmental pediatrics or in some centers uh, like mine through our pediatric rehabilitation medicine. And there's quite a lot of overlap between those disciplines, but thinking about optimizing the function and health of well-being. One of the things that's really valuable that comes out of team-based care is the ability to do team-based care conferencing. And that should be goal-directed and goal-driven. And you should be working to identify barriers and then how to solve those problems so that you have coordinated efforts, so that one person is not off doing one thing and another person is not trying to solve basically that same problem through another mechanism. Because families have told us duplicative care is not helpful to them. I really then I'm just going to end up on thinking about functional outcomes and, and interdisciplinary care and how that relates to it. So this is really well aligned with the 2004 definition of child's health that came out of the Institute of Medicine, in which children's health should be defined as the extent to which an individual child or group of children are able or enabled to develop and realize their potential, satisfy their needs, develop the capacities that allow them to interact successfully with their biological, physical, and social environments. And you saw Jeannie McAllister's definition of care coordination, and that really maps very well to this as well. And so does, obviously, thinking about the health neighborhood. Um, so in particular, this gives us an opportunity to think about the whole child in the context of their family and uh, helps us think about capacity building. So from a developmental um, expectation perspective, um, I hope that we stop just using the term developmental delay, because that's not what we're talking about for this population of children. These children will have lifelong um, disability, and thinking about optimizing their ability to function as successfully and participate in their environment as well as possible should be our goal. Uh, and we need to be sure that we're making accommodations when needed. And some of it might not be a abundantly clear as to when accommodations may be necessary. So having team members, whether it be from uh, developmental medicine or rehab medicine or therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy involved might really help um, develop a mechanism by which you can really uh, give the best, most robust care so children can be as successful as possible. And one of the things that comes out of pediatrics is the need for us to figure out how that we can actually get this to be feasible for primary care providers and subspecialty providers to do. And so I'm actually just ending on some um, recommendations about coding. There certainly may be a role for these families for home visits. And home visits are reimbursable, and they have various codes that are different than your office visits. You can also do preventative medicine counseling, and this is particularly relevant for the potentially asymptomatic child who may develop something. It's not preventative counseling about something that already exists. So if you are obese, you cannot charge preventative counseling about obesity. It already exists as a diagnosis. So these would be for, um, for things not yet diagnosed. And then the administration and interpretation of health risk assessment, which may be in particularly important as we think about screening and monitoring. Um, from a care coordination standpoint, more related to complex care in general, there's a lot of different codes for physician-level supervision for care coordination and medical team conferencing, which um, we bill, we do not get reimbursed for it. And then care planning and oversight for children who are receiving home care. And many of these are based on minutes. Additionally, there's a billing capability for complex care coordination by a clinical staff that's directed by the physician, and you can do this on a monthly basis. Um, and it can include face-to-face -face time or not face-to-face -face time by the physician. And then additional staff time is additionally um, codable and reimbursable. 
And then for um, the children that we're talking about specifically for this conference, there is a lot of um, central nervous system assessments that can be coded in addition to whatever you're doing in your visit. And some of us may be doing psychological testing, developmental testing, um, and neurobehavioral uh, status exams in our clinical setting, which are also um, a ability to be coded and then billed for, as well as um, even just paper-based brief emotional assessments. And then particularly relevant here is vision screening, which is also a billable uh, service. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is that I anticipate that we're talking about a high need of durable medical equipment for the population of babies born with congenital Zika. And what that means is that that increases the need for encounter-based documentation to get these services delivered. Um, so a year ago, we came with um, the MACRA rule about a necessary face-to-face -face encounter for physicians or um, NPs, uh, clinical nurse specialists, and PAs within six months before ordering durable medical equipment, and that needs to document that need. And so a family can't call you and say, oh, now my child needs a X, Y, and Z without adequate documentation for it to be paid for. This really came out of CMS and issues in the elderly population for um, expensive durable medical equipment like scooters for people who are on medic uh, care. And so it's a trickle down impact on kids, but it's particularly relevant that we're thinking about function and outcomes for these children in a way that we're documenting as such so that we can then support their medical equipment needs because these are what lets people live successfully at home, lets children and interact with their social environments as best as possible. So um, I want to thank you very much for your time and happy to take questions. So, Amy, Susan Hyman, could you comment what Ed said earlier about the potential progression of this disorder, that primary care providers are going to be in the position to talk about palliative care? And I'm, I didn't hear you talk about that in the context of um, comfort and training in the medical home. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing and um, something that many primary care physicians don't have a lot of experience in training with. And so um, it's often left to the tertiary care team-based uh, clinic to do those um, things. But I think what families want is from their pediatrician who they trust and know very well to be able to talk about and anticipate. And I think that issue about anticipation is particularly challenging because in addition to the kind of fear that exists about a new and unknown condition and um, the you know, lore in the media and information that may not be accurate. So there's a lot of emotional stuff at stake in addition to the emotions of knowing that your infant or baby is progressing in a way that um, really is concerning from a health and well-being perspective. And this, I think, is also complicated by the extreme irritability issue. Um, and I think that that will take a lot of um, very close attention and a lot of psychological support for families that may not be readily available in certain health neighborhoods um, and so hopefully can be accessed. But I think um, engaging and thinking about palliative care, not from a cancer, you are going to die in six months sort of way, but in a much more let's think about comfort and what our goals are, it's essential to be incorporating those into our goal setting. And that's an excellent point and what I didn't really spend a lot of time talking about Gabe's care map is there were a lot of legal issues that were at play and um, making decisions ahead of time about resuscitation and in intervention that need to be documented and planned and discussed before it gets to the point where those interventions have already been delivered. So that's an excellent point and certainly our, um, I think our pediatric palliative care colleagues would really embrace the idea of being more engaged um, as we think about this, especially in the um, infant period. Thank you. So as I think most of you know, there have been some pre-meeting discussions that have been ongoing, and uh, there are three groups. The first group that's going to be presenting is uh, Dr. Wanda Barfield, and I'll let you talk about what your, what your group is. So. 
Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Wanda Barfield. I'm, I'm the Director of the Division of Reproductive Health at CDC and the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention. And our group, Group 1, is also led by Sarah Oliver, who is an EIS officer in the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. And as it's been said before, this response is incredibly complex and involves many different folks from different parts of the organization. So we've so far had two meetings with experts to think about the issue of the initial management and care of infants with suspected congenital Zika virus infection. And um, I think it's important to note that uh, there's a current interim guidance, and given all of the evidence that continues to evolve, there's an opportunity for us to think about further guidance based on new information. So the last guidance was updated on February 26, 2016, and that had the considerations for revisions or expansion based on new recommendations. So um, what we're going to think about within this group one uh, with regard to current guidance is the population. So we have newborns who are suspected to be infected perinatally, and these are infants with suspected congenital Zika virus infection, but also those infants with microcephaly or intracranial calcifications detected prenatally and at birth. But I think what we've learned here so far is that there really is this spectrum. And so what do we need to consider, particularly in terms of the assessment of this population? The evaluation includes physical examination and lab evaluation, imaging studies and additional testing, and then the management including specialty and subspecialty consultation and inpatient care with outpatient referral. And one of the considerations we wanted to think about is the opportunity to certainly create continuity within the inpatient and outpatient environments. So again, this is the interim guidance, and I don't want to go into detail for all the recommendations, but the first figure um, talks about sort of a diagnostic path to think about infants whose mother have traveled or resided in an area with transmission uh, during pregnancy. And again, this is an evolving issue, and it may be that we're now starting to see um, changes within the U.S. in terms of uh, this evaluation. Um, but for the group here, the microcephaly or intracranial calcifications, we know what we've learned from our presenters today is that there could again, be a spectrum. And some of the things that we wanted to consider in our discussion was, um, given the current guidelines, what are some of the pieces of information that need to be updated or revised? So again, just thinking about the consideration of the population. So who are the infants that we're talking about? If we're talking about infants who are at risk for congenital infection and they're seen initially in the hospital, what kind of diagnostic evaluation needs to be done at that point. And then another discussion that had come up from individuals in our group were, um, what about infants who may be born in more remote areas? And what are some of the considerations in terms of initial hospitalization versus transfer? And how should we also think about infants, say, for example, within the first month or within the first weeks or first days based on how they might be seen. And again, we're fortunate as inf information is evolving that we're now starting to divine congenital Zika syndrome. However, there's still things that may need to be taken into consideration as we try to evaluate these infants. And then what other signs and symptoms could be considered symptomatic. Perhaps we don't see an infant with a lot of features of microcephaly. However, if there are some of the features that were described today in terms of abnormal cry and other features, how could we um, look at potential symptoms that would still um, fall within congenital Zika syndrome? And then what clinical problems may need to be addressed in the inpatient set setting given family's location, and resources for referral? And how can we avoid misdiagnosing newborns um, that may be attributable to other causes? 
We also want to think about how we're going to appropriately counsel parents as we assess their infants. Individuals talked about the concerns of issues related to ethics, issues of difficult uh, discussions with families. How do we support families um, in, the con in the context of uh, their infants? Um, other considerations for clinical and laboratory evaluation that was discussed by the group included whether an infant head ultrasound that's currently being recommended be conducted if a fetal ultrasound demonstrates microcephaly, and what other an assessments, including CT or MRI, should be conducted at that time. And do all infants with a mother who's traveled or resided to an area with Zika's virus transmission during pregnancy need an initial evaluation besides the assessment for microcephaly and intracranial calcifications. So of course, we've heard about the need for eye exams, hearing, and other labs. And then do infants need direct testing of their blood and serum if cord blood is available, particularly if they've been at risk? And we need to reevaluate the current recommendations, see if there's uh, further testing that should be done. Other questions that individuals raised was, should dengue testing occur in areas where there's no known transmission? In terms of thinking about uh, the amount of blood and serum that may need to be taken for infants, what things should be taken into consideration? CSF testing was also discussed, um, if that should be incorporated into the evaluation of an infant with su suspected congenital Zika virus infection who may not have obvious symptoms of a syndrome, and should testing of other body fluids, which was raised earlier this morning, to include uh, urine, saliva, and also blood spot um, was mentioned as well, um, and other laboratory testing, given that these infants have uh, CNS abnormalities, what other assessments, including endocrine evaluation or immune function testing, should be taken into consideration as well. Um, in terms of further ma management and follow-up, the other consideration is what other specialists should be included in the inpatient setting. We heard earlier today about the per perhaps the need for pulmonology, um, also the need of perhaps surgical or surgical subspecialty support um, that may need to be taken to, into consideration for these infants who may be very uh, medically complex. And then another discussion was that there are infants who are going to be located where uh, there may be limited resources. And so should these infants be transferred for further evaluation and management? And then given the potential limits of some tests, we may need to think about the timing of evaluation. And we did hear from Dr. Ventura about the assessment that they're doing in terms of retinal evaluation and timing. So are there certain times that we can think about, again, so that there's an opportunity for families to coordinate uh, their evaluation? And then what are the challenges of reporting these congenitally exposed infants to state, local, and territory health departments for inclusion in the U.S. Zika Pregnancy Registry. Currently, we get information that comes with regard to maternal testing and labs, and as we think also about uh, infant assessment and uh, infant follow-up, we're going to need to think about how that information may be reported so that we can continue to follow infants um, through, uh, through their um, care. Other um, considerations we've heard um, from Dr. Trevathan about the complex neurologic issues and um, how can we uh, assess those issues in terms of management. Um, also, other comorbid uh, conditions could occur, like infants could be affected with preterm birth or um, have sepsis, and how are we going to also assess those comorbid conditions? And would those conditions, would the management differ? Um, we've had some discussion about whether surgical interventions could be potentially different or not, and so these are things that we're taking into consideration. Also, more recently, given the case that um, we heard about in Utah, I think it's important for us to think about uh, the handling of body fluids. And we do know from information, at least for congenital CMV, that that's something that may be persistent for quite a long time, for months to years. So 
Should there be additional consideration in terms of infection control? And then what other considerations should we think about? So for, for group one, we're really thinking about defining the population of newborns for further evaluation with that initial birth that may uh, include an assessment for infants who do not appear to be affected, but then that group that does appear to be at risk for congenital Zika syndrome. And, what, and however, we do want to think about avoiding unnecessary workup and evaluation. Um, and then resources may be limited in certain areas, so we need to consider the timing of some lab and imaging studies and the location and availability in terms of pediatric resources. And then to maintain continuity of care, referrals need to be made for long-term care and evaluation, and we don't want in infants and children to be lost to follow-up. And those that have no evidence of abnormalities need to be followed, and that will be addressed by group three. So as we are having these discussions over the next couple of days, we want to think about how each of the groups will be able to connect and relate to each other so that we have a compre comprehensive assessment. So I just want to thank the group one contributors. Again, as was mentioned by Fan Tate, it really has been amazing to see how responsive people have been and uh, people were more than willing and able to participate in phone calls that were done you know, fair, with fairly short notice. And we just want to appreciate everyone's um, contributions and thank you all for your support. Thank you. How does this relate to the registry, the recommendations in the registry? So, so the current registry um, gets information that's reported to states about um, infants as well as uh, pregnant women and newborns. However, in terms of the co potential continuity of care and more information for follow-up, that's still part of what the registry is, is doing. But this is more clinical care and guidance for infants with suspected Zika virus infection. But at, at this time, the recommendation would be if you identified a patient, you would refer them to the registry. Ideally, yes. But that would go through the state health department. Yes. Yeah, I, th I think that just in terms of as the message goes out, yes, that there has to be clarity of what's being asked, because you're asking people to both refer to the registry so we learn things, but at the same time to follow the guidelines for clinical care. Yes, your point is really well taken. Yes. Um, excellent presentation, and I um, want to praise you for emphasizing the importance of longitudinal follow-up and engaging the families to understand the reason why. But currently, in many of the state programs with children with special health care needs, that direct engagement, sending out visiting nurses, making sure there is care coordination, making sure that their knowledge of available and where you need to go for regional resources is not taking place. And I would strongly suggest that this be an opportunity to really tighten up those fragmented services because this would not only be the appropriate thing to do scientifically, but it's the only way you're going to get more positive community responses and not misinformation and panic. 
Um, yes, I think that that's a really important issue, and I'm hoping that you know the expertise of Amy Hautrau and others can help us to really address this. I think um, Zika is not unique in the creation of challenges for children, and it may uncover some of the issues that really do need to be addressed in terms of creating comp continuity yeah. of care for these infants. And there will be substantial barriers that need to be addressed and uncovered. And, and I will just share with the audience is that uh, 30 years ago when I started my uh, physician career, I, got, I had the um, experience of seeing all the children who were graduates of the 1964 congenital rubella epidemic who were turning 21. So I started practice in 85. These children turned 21 in 85. And the parents were most grateful that the health departments had helped in facilitating accurate diagnosis, but they damned health departments for abandoning their children in an era before we had preschool supports, deafblind supports, and other kinds of things. And so I think that's a historic lesson that is important to understand and to make sure that we don't pretend that we don't have any resources and legislative power to do some of the things that are necessary for this. Yeah. So I think that some of this discussion will also be continued in group two and um, as well as as well as group three. So I, I think these are really great points. Uh, Renata Savage from University of Mississippi. What do we know about the sensitivity of the current testing and the turnaround time? Um, and I can just see a problem with maybe some of these babies will be discharged before the results come back or we're convinced that it really is Zika and, the, and it's a false negative. You know, what kind of guidance do we have at this moment for the medical community? Yeah, I think your point is really well taken in terms of timing, and perhaps Mark Fisher may be able to address some of this, but um, with regard to some of the testing that's going to CDC versus commercial labs, there's, there is a variation in terms of the time for return of information, and it will affect you know, the, the continuity of care and decision-making. So I think at this time, it's really variable. Yeah. Um, so the, the turnaround time depends <coughs> on the type of testing we're talking about in the laboratory it's going to. PCR testing has a uh, fairly rapid turnaround time, can be performed within the, the same day. The IgM antibody testing takes two days to complete, but if confirmatory testing is performed with PRNTs, that could take up to an additional uh, five to seven days to complete. So if you're performing PCR first uh, and that's negative and then you go on to IgM testing, the full battery of testing could take a week and a half to two weeks to complete at a public health laboratory. Commercial laboratories may have quicker turnaround with regard to PCR. As far as um, sensitivity, we don't know. Um, at this point, uh, we would expect that um, an infant that was infected congenitally, the ones who had consistent clinical findings, uh, most of them were born to women who were living in other countries and infected in other countries during early pregnancy. And the mothers are diagnosed either by PCR or IgM during their acute illness and the babies are still IgM positive at the time they're born. Um, most of the babies have not been, that I know of, PCR positive at birth. There have been uh, babies in other countries, a couple of reports of perinatally infected babies where PCR testing was useful. So it really depends on the uh, timing of the infection and the specific uh, situation that's being assessed as to what will be the appropriate testing and the specimens that will be tested, I think, is still being worked out. At this point, we recommend testing on serum for PCR and IgM and then CSF when indicated, but I think evaluation of urine has been discussed um, needs to be considered. Yes, and um, Sarah Oliver and I are working with um, other experts and the pregnancy and birth defects team to think about um, diagnostic testing 
that uh, should be considered. So that's evolving as well. And I, I think um, those points are really important in terms of the timing issue that you raise. As part of diagnostic testing, would there be consideration of taking advantage of a new modality, let's say, like uh, optical coherence tomography of retinas to centralize that so that the link between the lab values and some of the biomarkers, both CNS and ocular, could occur? Um, I'm not really familiar with that technology. Um, certainly would be open to any input, but um, I think another broader issue that was brought up more practically speaking was uh, telemedicine opportunities, particularly with regard to assessment of the retina, um, and given what we may know in terms of potential limited resources geographically. Yeah. And, and I would build on the ways that ophthalmologists, pediatric ophthalmologists from regional centers have figured out how to follow the diverse group not analogous to this population of retinopathy of prematurity yep. and retinopathy of prematurity in developing countries because they've really worked hard to develop some of that telemedicine uh, capability and thank you so much for bringing that up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The, um, ROP is active, so it's an active disease, and yes. you have to do the telemedicine in, according uh, to follow these babies because they can progress to blindness. Um, in these cases, the progression it will be from, uh, let's say, a nerve up to from a, a pink nerve to a pale nerve, but the disease cannot as long as we are following now. It, the scar is not increasing. There's no progression in terms of aggression to the eye. So I think the telemedicine is important. The documentation is important for sure, but in not, not with the sense of, okay, we need to um, follow because maybe the, these babies, they need to, refer, to be referred to a, a, a tertiary center for care, treatment, what I mean. Um, also, OCT, as you were mentioning, um, we have done in eight cases OCT, and it's very hard to do OCT in babies. The, they do not cooperate. They are crying, like I said. Uh, we took maybe one whole day to have those images, and they do not bring us so much information for general care. It's more an ophthalmological um, curiosity, let's say, to see where the, the, the aggression of the, the virus or the toxins that the virus releases, we still don't know what's causing these lesions, uh, what layers of the retina are being affected. But not for, I don't think this for general, to make it as part of a guideline, this is not really necessary for all babies. It's really hard to do in all babies. Yeah. Thank you. So just to keep us moving on along in time, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Jan Cragen. Uh, she's from the National Center on Birth Effects and Developmental Disabilities, and she's going to be talking about the work from Group 2. Thank you, Sonia. And I want to introduce my co-lead for this group is Dr. Lillianne Lewis, who's an EIS officer in the National Center on Environmental Health. So our group was, was um, tasked with looking at outpatient care and follow-up through the first year of life for infants with anomalies thought to be associated with congenital Zika virus infection. And so these were infants that have laboratory evidence of infection with Zika virus or with an unspecified flavivirus, and who also have microcephaly or at least one of the other anomalies that's thought to be associated with congenital Zika infection. And we were tasked with looking at um, care, you know, the, the best type of care for pediatric providers in the primary care setting, but also looking at providers who are working in settings with limited resources. So those without pediatric subspecialty relative, rel, um, readily available, 
or where parents have to travel to get care, for example. So currently, the guidelines on the CDC website talk about long-term follow-up for infants with positive or inconclusive Zika virus test results that include an additional hearing screen at six months of age, an audiology follow-up of abnormal newborn hearing screening. It calls for continued evaluation of developmental characteristics and milestones, as well as head circumference through the first year of life in consultation with appropriate medical specialists, such as pediatric neurology, development, and behavioral pediatrics, physical and speech therapy, if any abnormalities are noted and as concerns arise. And so as we listened to people talk on the pre-conference calls and got some individual feedback by email from folks, there were some general concepts or approaches that seemed to emerge. One of these was that care of the newborn with anomalies thought to be associated with Zika infection is a continuum. So there's a need for medical homes, but subspecialty care and coordination of community resources um, that begins really at birth. The evaluation, the plans that are made, the consultations that happen in that newborn period need to be continued and followed through over the next months and built upon. A second concept was that the disease manifestation and management can vary from infant to infant. So clearly not all of these infants have the same abnormalities. They're all not going to need exactly the same care. Um, that really we need to develop some guidance that can be um, customized to the individual patient. Another concept had to do with the fact that um, the systems available for care can vary from state to state. So qualifications for Medicaid or early intervention services differ. Um, a child may, may qualify for those services in one state, but in, not in another, depending on what their condition is. And also that there are available family-to-family -family health information cities, centers um, where families with children with disabilities help new families dealing with these issues um, navigate the, the health care system and draw on that kind of support. Another approach was the need to utilize and link existing guidelines and inf infrastructure and to avoid reinventing the wheel. So, for example, use of standardized preventive pediatric health care schedules such as the AAP Bright Futures program, to utilize standardized developmental screening tools, as you've always heard, already heard, to build on the existing protocols for evaluation and referral of infants, for example, with retinopathy of prematurity, not for the same care, but that those referral patterns and the specialists um, involved may have a basis to, to help with the Zika infants as well. Similarly, um, building on the early hearing detection and intervention programs, recommendations about referrals for any child with an abnormal hearing, um, screen needs to be referred for vision screening and other types of testing as well. And then there was the realization that there's need for ongoing monitoring for new manifestation, manifestations and progression of existing symptoms. So as it, we've already talked about, worsening of neurologic impairment over time, new onset of seizures that may have not previously been, been apparent, continued failure of head growth, development of overt microcephaly over time. So we organized our thinking around several different domains or just areas of care that are needed for these infants. One of these was the medical home. And there was the realization that you need to provide general pediatric care for these infants as you would for any other child so that they get the childhood regular immunizations. Dental care is another thing that comes to mind. We need to ensure that there's coordination of specialty care and planning for care of existing conditions. And as I said, that begins in the newborn period. You need to provide ongoing monitoring for new conditions or progression of existing ones. Need to facilitate and refer families for support and link them with community resources. And then to assist in the planning for longer term care. We, talked, we heard a little bit about palliative care if that's needed. In terms of growth, nutrition, and feeding, 
There is the need for frequent measurement of weight length and head circumference throughout the first year. There's a need for assessment of swallowing impairment. In the, when, is the baby going to be able to manage solid foods, and when will that happen? And then watch the, for the risk of aspiration and uh, gastroesophageal reflux. In terms of development, again, we wanted to ensure that the planned follow-up with developmental or behavioral specialists or referrals to early intervention um, noted at birth is continued and that you facilitate initiation of that care. There's the need to perform regular developmental assessment, including motor and behavioral development throughout the first year to monitor for deterioration of existing function, emergence of additional developmental abnormalities or comorbid conditions. And that developmental screening, and I would say it's, it's really more of a developmental assessment and not just screening, um, but the assessment of these children's development needs to be done using a standardized instrument. In terms of hearing, one of the issues brought up was that otoacoustic emissions and auditory brainstem response testing really assess somewhat different things. And ABR is perhaps more um, focused on hearing loss that occurs as a result of CNS neurologic impairment. And so we don't really know yet which is the best way to assess hearing impairment in these infants. And it may be that both types of testing need to be done at some point to really understand what's going on. There's the need, again, to ensure that the plan follow-up with an audiologist is, is done if there's an abnormal newborn hearing screen. And to obtain an additional hearing screen at six months of life, even if the screening at birth was normal. In terms of vision, again, the insured plan follow up with ophthalmologists for abnormal findings. And if an exam is not performed at birth, then referral for an eye exam, including a retinal evaluation after hospital discharge. In terms of neurologic symptoms, um, we wanted to be sure that follow up with the neurologist is um, conducted as, as identified. We feel there should be periodic assessment for new neurologic symptoms or progression of existing ones, even if the initial neurologic evaluation was normal. So watching for new onset seizures, as you've heard, and those can manifest in subtle ways, such as infantile spasms or partial seizures. And then there's the need to discuss plans with the neurologist for management of ongoing symptoms. So for example, if a child is on medication for seizures, what does the primary pediatrician do if there are breakthrough seizures? As the child grows, does the dose need to be adjusted? Those, those kinds of issues. In terms of mobility, this can involve contractures, arthrogryposis, hypertonia, hypotonia, or specific anomalies such as club foot. Again, insured plan for follow-up with physical therapy, occupational therapy, and rehabilitation specialist for abnormalities noted at birth and as new ones occur. One suggestion was to build on the existing network of care for infants with cerebral palsy who um, will have many of these same referrals. Um, they may get different care, but if you have those referral patterns set and you know who to call on, you know who to refer some of the Zika infants to as well. And then assure that there's orthopedic care for the club foot or any other limb anomalies that are present. And then there were a few areas, um, other thoughts that we had. One was assessing whether these infants are at increased ri risk for infection. And that emphasized the need to obtain routine childhood immunizations. But there is a precaution for pertussis-containing vaccines in the setting of progressive or unstable neurologic disorders, uncontrolled seizures, or progressive encephalopathy um, until those conditions are stabilized. So that's something that needs to be thought about in some of these Zika infants as well. In terms of respiratory status, monitoring for apnea, aspiration, frequent infections, and other complications. In terms of endocrine dysfunction, which has been related to abnormal CNS development, there's the potential for an increased risk for hypothalamic dysfunction leading to pituitary deficiency. And this can manifest with hypothyroidism, growth hormone deficiency, or central adrenal insufficiency. 
We thought about bowel and bladder care, which is maybe not such an issue over the first year of life, but in just monitoring patterns and looking at ultimate plans for toilet training, if that's going to be possible. The irritability of these infants and management of sleep disruption, probably both for the infant and the family. And then the importance of reporting infant outcomes at two months, six months, and 12 months of age um, as, um, is um, as is asked by the USC Seca Pregnancy Registry. There are specific forms to be filled out in follow-up for each of these infants in the registry that usually gets reported to the health department, which then reports to the registry. And I think um, we felt that needed to be done as well not get lost in all the, the care that's going on. So what we hope to accomplish this afternoon is to try to identify some of the specific tests and timing of evaluations over those first 12 months with the goal of hopefully developing perhaps a timeline of care for practitioners and for parents to look at the things that need to be assessed, you know, what's coming up next. The parents can be prepared for all the things that are being looked at. We want to outline content that might help the development of toolkits for providers and parents if those if that's going to happen. And then one additional item was to try to quantify the additional time for care and reporting that's going to be required of providers and list the appropriate CPT codes and modifiers that will help them be in reverse be reimbursed for those. So I also want to thank all the members of the work group that have contributed so far and those that provided information for our consideration. And with that, I think I'll stop. Thanks. codes, and I wonder if anybody has an update um, on that discussion. I'll have to ask people from AAP. Go ahead, Sonia. We didn't, the group didn't get further than just recognizing that that was something that needed to be addressed. Fan. Yeah, I think, Bonnie, at least initially when we were talking about it, it was CPT codes specifically related to Zika per se. But all the rest of the things that we're talking about, as you know so well, already have the appropriate codes. And I, I don't know. We have not moved forward on, no, we on did the other. Have a, at least a couple of discussions. There were a couple of discussions. But as you know, it'll, it would take, um, we'll be looking at that still, but it, it takes a while <laughs> <coughs> to um, move something like that forward. But it's a, it's a good point. So again, Renat Savic, um, what is known about the long-term course of, particularly the babies that have severe microcephaly, do we anticipate it, that they will pass away from apnea? I mean, I noticed you talked about apnea monitoring. Are we going to tell the families, rush to the ER and intubate your baby and this will get better? Or is this the natural progression? I, I want to worry, you know, I worry a little bit that we don't give them a false message of if you do everything right, things will be fine when there may be a natural progression like a trisomy 18 or a severe mm -hmm. anencephalic. And you know, I think this is causing some ethical consternation among neonatologists about how aggressive should we be when we don't know. But I mean, if there were another baby that had some of these CNS findings, in some situations we might not be particularly aggressive, or at least offer that to the families. And I, I don't know that we're offering so much non-intervention. And, and what's the right answer? I don't know that either. But I think that has to be brought up during this day and a half. Or what the MFM community should be offering to families as well. Yeah. I, I think we don't really have answers for the lo the, that longer term, you know, how long infants are going to live, what may be the complicating factors that contribute to death of those that die. Um, you know, how can we predict that based on, you know, the findings early on? Um, we didn't talk about that a lot yet in the group. I think that's an excellent point. We did mention, um, you know, planning for longer-term care, and that would, of course, include some anticipatory counseling about the possible outcomes. Sure. That's an important point. 
but I'd say we really don't know quite how to frame that yet. Hi, Katie Beckman, the Administration for Children and Families. Um, I apologize if my comments that I'm about to make have been addressed elsewhere, but I, I haven't, I don't think I've heard them quite yet. Um, I, I hear, I, I've heard about a care plan beginning at birth, and I'm a bit concerned about um, a lack of discussion about education and support of the family during prenatal care. And the reason I, I mention this is because I think, I think it's a little too late to begin that care planning at birth. Um, those beginning months are critical for attachment to develop. And as many of you know, with the irritability, with crying, difficulty to soothe, feed, um, forming that attachment and building self-efficacy as new parents is incredibly difficult. Risk for uh, postnatal depression is incredibly high. And um, I think we really need to take it seriously that we're not just caring for the child, but we're, we're caring for the family as a whole. And that really needs to be seamless support from prenatal through the lifespan. Thank you. We'll, we'll take that recommendation, particularly about prenatal counseling as well. Sharon Lehman, uh, ophthalmology. Uh, I would just counsel that you have a follow-up for the audiologic care, but you have no follow-up scheduled for ophthalmology. And I would just rethink that, and I'm happy to talk with your group about that. Uh, I, many of the things that are going to go wrong are not going to be evident at that first retinal exam. And everybody's focusing on the retina here, and that's a done deal. Yeah. It's really the neurologic visual impairment that's going to, uh, and there are interventions that are specific to CVI mm. that can be used. So I would suggest that you that you rethink that and and have a three to six month or however you want to coordinate it, but it needs there needs to be follow up with the ophthalmologist. Yeah, this was just sort of the initial kind of um, topics that we we brought up. Um, our discussion this afternoon is going to be more to that point of, okay, when do these mm -hmm. things need to be assessed? And that's a very good one. I, we didn't mean that this was the recommendation mm -hmm. for, for eye care. Uh, uh, Michael Agus, I'm uh, from Boston and representing AP critical care as well as in the chronology. So just on the critical care um, part for group one, we had been talking about the AAP guideline on um, withdrawal of care or not offering advanced care. And so I think that's certainly something that our group can kind of talk about for the initial inpatient phase. Um, on the endocrine side, though, uh, I, I just wanted to, I appreciate the fact that you have some testing that you're planning to uh, schedule over the first year. Uh, but I would just caution that some of the, you know, uh, central deficiencies um, in it, uh, originating in the pituitary, by the time they get recognized with frankly low levels, uh, certainly in the severe group, I'm not sure what, what we can do, but if there is really this spectrum, then there's going to be a group that we can really intervene and, and make a big difference on. And so I wonder if there's a way to... Um, schedule or kind of recruit some kind of cohort for provocative, you know, testing to look mm -hmm. at the hypothalamic pituitary, say, thyroid or growth hormone axes so that we can, uh, with provocative testing, kind of actively pick those up in some subset, maybe establish some kind of um, prevalence and, and then go back into the more general community with uh, better screening and interventions. That's a great idea. Thank you. third discussion is going to be led by Dr. Kate Russell, and she is an EIS officer, an Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer at CDC, and has done a major amount of the planning for this meeting, so. Okay, good morning. I will be uh, presenting on the fine air discussions of group three, which focused on the outpatient care and follow-up for infants with congenital Zika virus infection, but without apparent abnormalities at birth. 
So the first thing that I wanted to mention is that um, the majority of the information that we know so far, which is already limited about congenital Zika virus infection, has really focused um, on infants with microcephaly or infants with other neurologic manifestations that have been present at birth. Um, and we really don't know much yet about what um, manifestations there might be for infants who are asymptomatic at birth. Um, or really about the long-term effects of congenital Zika virus infection. Um, the one things that we can take, we can look at to sort of to help us determine what our recommendations um, should be, would be um, the effect of Zika virus, as Dr. Trevathan mentioned this morning, on the actual neural progenitor cells and migration, which would make us concerned that there could be neurologic sequelae that develop over time. Um, the other things that our group sort of looked at to take into consideration were um, the effects of other congenital infections that can be lead to delayed sequelae. So we do know that um, congenital CMV, for example, can lead to delayed hearing loss as well as other um, neurologic outcomes, chorioretinitis, et cetera. Um, congenital toxoplasmosis, congenital HIV can both learn, lead to delayed neurologic sequelae. So even though our information about asymptomatic congenital Zika virus infection is limited, we can use this knowledge to help determine um, how we might think about um, management and follow-up for infants without apparent abnormalities at birth. So using that information, our group um, came up with these four domains of care uh, to focus on for these infants, and those were growth and developmental screening, um, vision, hearing, and family support and engagement. <clears throat> So we recognize that engagement of caregivers is key, particularly for the early, develop, uh, early detection of developmental delay. Based on information available to date, early signs of delay associated with congenital Zika virus infection may include feeding issues, hypo or hypertonicity, inability to self-regulate, irritability, poor visual tracking, and or lack of response to voice or sounds. Any, re any recommendations for screening for developmental delay should be in line with current AAP developmental screening recommendations, which currently include monitoring of infant's development at all well-child visits, as well as standardized screenings at ages 9, 18, and 24 months, or for any caregiver or primary care provider concerns. Our group discussed that recommendations should emphasize the routine monitoring of growth, including head circumference and development at each well-child visit, and emphasize the use of clinical judgments for referrals. Our group considered the potential recommendation of using a standardized screening tool, such as the Ages and Stages questionnaire, prior to the recommended nine-month standard screening for infants with congenital Zika virus infection. Referrals should be made based on concerns or failed screenings and include referrals to early intervention services, specialists, therapy, and supportive services. Information should be provided to caregivers to enable them to monitor their child's development and inform them on resources available if concerns arise. Finally, recommendations should make use of existing infrastructure in place for developmental screening and support for children with developmental delay. In terms of vision screening, the effect of congenital Zika virus infection on vision outside of infants with associated brain abnormalities, such as microcephaly, is not currently known. Also, when developing recommendations, we need to consider that subspecialty services, such as pediatric ophthalmology, may not be easily accessible. We again discuss the recommendations should stress adherence to current recommendations for eye exams of infants at every well visit. We discussed whether or not recommendations should be made for repeat comprehensive eye exam by pediatric ophthalmologist at six months of age for all infants versus referral only if concerns arise, again assuming that these infants have had a normal eye exam at birth. For hearing, again, the impact of congenital Zika virus infection remains unknown, including the impact of congenital Zika virus infection on hearing loss outside of microcephaly, the possibility of progressive hearing loss, and whether associated hearing loss may be central or peripheral. All infants should already be receiving a newborn hearing screen, and infants who fail this screening should be referred. Our group discussed whether or not infants who passed their initial newborn hearing screen needed a repeat hearing screen at six months of age, or repeat screening only if concerns arise. We also discussed what hearing tests should be recommended, if any, keeping in mind that evoked response testing is better for detecting central hearing loss, but autoacoustic emissions testing may be more accessible, and that it can be done in some pediatric offices. 
Finally, our group recognized the need for both family support and engagement. Caregivers are a critical component, both in care delivery as well as early identification of any delays or abnormalities. These families will be uncertain about the diagnosis of Zika, congenital Zika virus infection and the impact on their child's health. Recommendations should focus on empowering families to be active participants in their child's care. This will require providing caregivers with information on what to look for, as well as resources available should they have concerns. Recommendations should utilize systems currently in place to provide support and resources to families. Our group suggests considering the development of a toolkit for primary care providers to give to families to find the support they need. This toolkit would not reinvent the wheel, rather gather currently available resources such as those listed here. In summary, we felt that there were four areas to focus recommendations for infants with congenital Zika virus infection, but no apparent abnormalities at birth. Growth and development, vision, hearing, and family support. Any recommendations should stress the importance of current guidelines for monitoring growth and development. We should be utilizing systems and resources currently in place to engage and empower caregivers. Remaining questions include the risks and benefits of additional developmental vision, sorry, developmental vision and hearing screening, as well as determining how best to provide information and resources to healthcare providers and caregivers on what to look for and how to address concerns. Thank you to all of the Group 3 participants who contributed um, to these slides, and are there any questions? <laughs> I'll just uh, make a quick comment and then a question. I, I, uh, I think many of us, although we may not have said it yet, and this is a good time to say it and that since uh, Dr. Russell's presenting, but we, I think it's been very impressive uh, how EIS has really been a key, <laughs> taken key role in this response and that there's so many great EIS officers involved from around uh, the agency. It's, it, it really is, is, is very refreshing, and uh, I know it's, a, it's made the response a lot better. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>So just a comment about several speakers throughout the morning have talked about early intervention, oh, Don Bailey from RTI International, um, about the role of early intervention in, in all of this. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out in different states. So as you know, we have different criteria for getting into early intervention. You either have to have a um, you know, documented developmental delay. You have to have a condition that you know, is clearly known to result in a delay like Down syndrome. And then some states have an at-risk category. Um, and so clearly for babies who are born with Zika-related microcephaly, they're gonna fit into the established conditions um, criteria. But this, this group of babies is, is not. And so um, it's gonna be interesting to see whether some states decide this is a risk, a risk category, like low birth weight or something like that, that would be tracked and be immediately eligible for early intervention whereas others might not be, and it gets back, harkens back to the discussion about the whole question about case definitions and diagnosis and so forth. So there are a lot of social political uh, dynamics that are gonna occur here as well as the, the medical, medical dynamics. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yes, thank you. And I think a lot of, um, a lot of it's gonna fall on sort of families and primary caregivers to be really um, very observant and be, be advocates for these infants and sort of have a, a lower threshold for sort of what they're looking for because there are so many unknowns. Thank you. Yes. So I'm just wondering, so this group would be those mothers who either traveled to an area that was endemic or assuming it comes to the United States, have the physical findings, the mothers, of Zika virus infection during their pregnancy. They're tested positive. Prenatal testing has been done with ultrasound or whatever, and the baby looks totally fine. Mm -hmm. So any estimate of how large that, that group would be or 
um, yeah. recommendations <laughs> <Great> for, <question. laughs> for yeah. whether the baby should go f through further testing if mm -hmm. there's no abnormal fetal ultrasound. Um, yes. And, and it sort of goes into the mm -hmm. congenital group one, but... Yeah, and that's something we're going to be talking about more, and I think Group 1 will be talking about more as well as that sort of initial evaluation. You know, we would want to focus any guidance on sort of long-term follow-up and care on infants that have um, some evidence for congenital Zika virus and infection, and we've, we've heard a lot about how, how much evidence do you need and exactly how difficult the interpretation of testing is, and I would say that, you know, based on that, I think we need to make guidance that's focused on not just confirmed congenital Zika virus infection, but also this sort of probable, um, these probable cases that maybe have sort of difficult to interpret testing. Um, but we would sort of want to focus these longer term recommendations on children that have some laboratory evidence of congenital Zika virus infection. As to um, predicting how many, I'm not sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. I just, to respond to that, putting on my AAP hat, developmental screening and monitoring is recommended to all yes. providers and it's EPSDT required. And since we don't know how common it is, we do know how common other high-risk conditions are. All yes. children should be screened and monitored. Yes, there are many, many reasons to do developmental screening for these infants, um, for all infants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Do you remember that? Another question, though, related to that is, what is the population at risk? And I think we know generally how many people travel to countries that are um, affected, and I know the mm -hmm. number is probably going up, but if you, count, if you can estimate how many pregnant are traveling to these mm -hmm. areas, I think if we get a general, a general idea, I mean, I... I would imagine that it wouldn't be in the millions, mm -hmm. but there's definitely a fair number. But I think as Susan mentioned, if you follow the team, right, we could do you some be able to pick up projections mm -hmm. of patients of interest. Um, hi, Katie Beckman again. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important to consider the role of early care and education in the monitoring piece for developmental and behavioral screening. Um, you know, children spend 50, 60 hours a week in early care and education settings, and sometimes those providers are in an incredible, I mean, a lot of times, they're in an incredibly valuable intersection point. In addition, families build trust with those providers, and so I think there's a really important intersection, especially since they're children with developmental and behavioral vulnerabilities who are not yet or may never be eligible for early intervention. And so the training of those providers is mm -hmm. really important in this. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I, I, this is Camille at CDC. I want to piggyback on what Katie was saying, because um, I was actually thinking the same thing. But I also not only want to include the early care and education providers, but, but I think one thing that I appreciated in your presentation was that you were really looking at existing systems that serve young children, because I think, you know, when you think about over 50% of children are seen in WIC clinics, and I think, you know, if we kind of, if we really can, from a capacity building standpoint, make sure that, that the clinicians are aware of what those existing systems are, mm -hmm. so, and that there's an outreach to WIC to those help me grow to the, whatever the state capacity system is beyond the early intervention system yes. where these kids may not be eligible, mm -hmm. but, but, where, but go to where they are. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. Thank piece. you. Yeah, excellent presentation. And I think your emphasis on um, getting the message out to the primary care community is very important. But the lesson that I experienced because I practiced in the early 90s in Rhode Island when con screening for congenital newborn hearing loss was instituted is our classic management plans in the community, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, et cetera, in the state of Rhode Island at that time did not cover hearing aids, hearing aid follow-up, a whole panoply of things. Mm -hmm. That situation has been exacerbated 
the states have gone to Medicaid managed care carve outs and this access to essential health services for individuals at risk is pretty fragmented currently. And so your guidelines are most helpful in getting this set. The second comment I would make is that Dr. Bailey's eloquent statement that the microcephalic children will be well served by early intervention. That may be true in the state of North Carolina. It is not true in many states. The states are confused at times with single established conditions and they're confused what to exactly do in their roles for care coordination in EI for mm -hmm. children, whether they have spina bifida or CP or microcephaly or Down syndrome. And so I would just highlight that. But most important, neither EI nor the community system are very good when there's early unilateral sensory neural hearing loss. Mm -hmm. And our experience with congenital CMV is that we have to track and manage these kind of disorders. And embedded in picking up abnormal hearing loss should be a linkage to both the treatable conditions that may not be Zika. Yes. And again, I don't want to go into zebras, which are, can children have both congenital Zika and congenital CMV? I don't want to go there. It's not but, making more complicated. Uh, that's both out there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much for your comments. I just clarify that I, I said that they would be eligible for early intervention, not that they would be getting outstanding <laughs> services. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amanda Hall. I'm the Title V MCH director from Texas. And I just think as we're thinking about that and we're thinking about systems and states mm -hmm. that engaging the Title V MCH and children with special health care needs services programs across the United States is going to be important as you're looking at these systems of care. Mm -hmm.